Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm excited. Today we're beginning a brand new series of studies, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. Did you know the word covenant appears, I think it's 287 times in the Hebrew Scriptures alone, referring to human covenants, but also the covenant between God and His people. In this series, we'll be looking at God's everlasting covenant. I know you'll be blessed as you see a God who loves us with an immeasurable and unfailing love, who wants us to spend eternity with Him. So welcome to our series. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School. And welcome to the team. Amen. Good to be together again. Look, here we are, the Gideon's <laughs> Band. People say, what does that mean, Gideon's <laughs> Band? Well, it meant that it was scaled down to a small group. And we know because of the pandemic, we've got social distancing. But God's blessing us in spite of the restrictions. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we're just glad you're with us for Hope Sabbath School today. You may also be confined. I talked to someone recently, a Hope Sabbath School member, and she said, I cannot even go out of my apartment to buy food. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that's a different country. I said, oh, I hope you have a little supply of food. But you know, God is working in spite of the challenges, maybe in the midst of them, because there's a promise that He can work all things for good to those who love Him. Well, here's a few emails from Hope Sabbath School members. We got a whole flood of emails coming in, and we love to hear from you. You write to us at sshope at hopetv.org. We've got Hope Sabbath School members in more than 200 countries around the world. Amen? Amen. Here's one from Australia, and I flagged it. I said, this is powerful. Elizabeth writes, Hello, Hope Sabbath School. Hello. Hello. I want to thank you so much for your study. Because of health issues, I can no longer go to church, but your Hope Sabbath School each week is a terrific blessing to me. But then came this powerful testimony, Nicole, just touched my heart. Years ago, my daughter died at age five, and I blamed God. Mm. A workmate was an Adventist, and I was blaspheming one night. She asked me to stop, mm. to which I replied, why? Mm. God doesn't care about me. Mm. He let my precious daughter die. Mm. To cut a long story short, she asked me if she brought a video into me, would I watch it? I said, maybe. <laughs> well, I studied the Bible and I've been baptized. Amen. Amen. I know that God never left me in those seven years when I left Him, mm -hmm. and I am so grateful for that. God is so good to all of us sinners. My love to you all. Elizabeth. Amen? Amen. Isn't that a powerful testimony? Oh, yeah, yep. wow. Elizabeth, thanks for writing from mm -hmm. New South Wales, Australia. Someone heard your testimony today and they said, God, could you give me that renewed hope mm -hmm. to come back to you? Mm -hmm. Well, Delma writes to us from West Virginia in the United States of America. He says, I'm 83 years old and I was born with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. That's where you get injured in the birth, right? My disability does not allow me to retain information that I read, but I thank God that every Sabbath I can watch Hope Sabbath School and get spiritual fulfillment. Thank you for your service to our Lord. Delma. Amen? Amen. You know, we have no idea, do we? Oh. Such a variety of people joining us for an in-depth interactive study. Delma, thanks for being part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Here's a note from a donor. Uh, in New York in the United States and says, thank you all for the blessings I receive through Hope Channel, especially Hope Sabbath School. God bless you all. And I say, we received the blessing. What about you? Amen. We need that every Amen. time we film. And a gift from this uh, generous donor of $400 Amen. to help the ministry of Hope Channel. Thank you to all of our donors. You make a difference in this donor-supported ministry. Well, Pierre writes to us from Canada, and Pierre says, I was baptized after attending an evangelistic series in Montreal when I was 57 years old. I attended the three-week seminar, and at the end of the series, I took a leap of faith mm -hmm. and was baptized, trusting that God would guide me. Yeah. Well, I'm studying the Bible since then, and I'm watching Hope Sabbath School to help me understand Bible truth. Isn't that awesome? Wow. God is so good. 
Thank you for the great work of the Hope Sabbath School team. May God bless you now and forever. And we say the same to you, Pierre. We're so thankful that you took that leap of faith. You know, we still have questions even when we learn about God's immeasurable and unfailing love, right? Yeah. We don't have all of the questions answered, yeah. all of our problems solved. But Pierre took a leap of faith. God bless you, my brother. Thanks for writing to us. One last note. Ah, Nicole, this sister Veronica is from Jamaica. <laughs> so a little, little smile from Nicole. <laughs> Saints of God, she says, may the good Lord continue to lead, direct, and strengthen you as you minister to us and share the good news of our Savior winning souls for the kingdom of God. I want to hear those words. Well done, mm -hmm. good and faithful servant. Amen. What about you? Amen. <laughs> well, she's turned into a preacher. <laughs> Let's continue to hold on to God's unchanging hands and promises. Our Savior is coming back, so let us prepare for His return. Well, Trisha Lee, do you have Jamaican roots too? Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> well, why did you give Veronica a wave too? You know, we have a lot of Hope Sabbath School members around the world, including the beautiful island of Jamaica, and we are so thankful that you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Right now, we need you to help us with our theme song, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. It's 3,000 years old, but it's to a beautiful melody that my wife composed. And uh, we can't sing it here in the studio because of the restrictions. So will you sing it with us? Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, we want to hear that word of Scripture and give thanks to you today and call upon your name and say, Lord, uh, we want to make known your deeds among the peoples. And, and so as we study your word today, I pray the Holy Spirit will guide us as we discover your everlasting covenant of love. May you be our teacher, Holy Spirit. May Hope Sabbath School members around the world be blessed we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if someone took your Bible away oh, man. and they said, uh, what's the first sentence in the Bible? Well, you'd say, well, the first book is the book of Genesis, Genesis. Genesis which means beginnings, right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Anybody want to help, <laughs> Trisha Lee? How does it begin? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. So, uh, if we didn't know anything else except those words, and of course that's an English translation of the Hebrew, if we just had those four words, what vital truth would we have learned? God was in the beginning. That God was in the beginning, yeah. that there is a God. God. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. That we're not just here by accident and nobody else out there, that there is a God. Patricia Lee, what translation of the Bible do you have today? New King James Version. Would you read Genesis 1 and verse 1 because Having shared that precious truth that there is a God, um, it shares more. Now, who's writing the book of Genesis? Anybody? Moses. The prophet. Moses. It's the prophet Moses, right? And obviously, he wasn't there at the creation. <laughs> right. No. You say, that's right, even Adam and Eve weren't there until later. <laughs> yeah. But he's given by a divine revelation the events mm -hmm. 
Remember, Peter said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. How does the prophet Moses record the rest of that verse in Genesis 1-1? I'm reading from the New King James Version. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So again, we've added a little bit now. What vital truth have we learned in addition to the fact that there was a God in the beginning? Jason? God created and God created the heavens and the earth. So the things that we see and experience, God made them. So that theme is throughout all scripture. Now you might have a text that you can think of. I jotted a few down in our outline. And by the way, you can download our outline at our website, hopetv.org slash hope SS. You can use the same outline and follow along with us. But let's read a few verses. Nicole, uh, would you read for us from Psalm 100 and verse 3? This is uh, Psalm, well, that's about 1000 BC, so that's 3000 years ago, but, but a long time after the creation account as told by Moses. What does the psalmist say? The New International Version of Psalms 103 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Mm -hmm. So there's another truth we've learned there. Help me with that. It not only reaffirms that there is a God who's the Creator. What, what else do you learn from that verse, Nicole? He created us, he crea not just the heavens and the earth. Okay, He, also created he created us the, the, the human family. What else do you learn, Jason? That, that God is relational. Ah. You know, that we're His people. <laughs> you know, there, there, there is a, a, a kind of a theology, philosophy, that God started things and then just kind of went off. He didn't want a relationship with us, right? Uh, Christian, what do they call that? Do you remember? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> it's called deism. Yeah. deism. That's oh, right. Deism. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, well, there's a God, but he doesn't want a relationship yeah. with us. He but is Jason that. is saying, no, he <laughs> wants a relation. We are his people. 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 Yes. And the sheep, that's, a past, that's kind of a protector, relation, yeah, exactly. caring. Yep. Uh, let's let's uh, look at another text. Christian, did you want to read for us from Isaiah chapter okay. 40, verse for sure. 28? Now that's about 300 years after the Psalms, around 700 BC. So we're, we're finding this being repeated about the Creator God. What do you read there? All right, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Amen. So he's the creator again, and his, you know, <laughs> someone says, well, I don't understand how God was able to speed things out of nothing. That's what the Bible says happened, right? Mm -hmm. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably because you're not God, okay? <laughs> yeah. But let's keep looking at the theme. Let's go to the New Testament now. And uh, Jason, could you read for us from uh, Acts chapter 17? Uh, I think Paul's now here in Athens, isn't he? And he's talking with these philosophers who, of course, have all kinds of theories about how we got here. What does Paul say in Acts 17 and verse 24? I have the New King James Version. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So he's the creator, but what else did we learn about him from the verse? He's not just uh, a physical structure. He's He's beyond our, our buildings. He's beyond our idols that they had at that okay. time. Okay. There was something else right before that. He's not only the creator. He's, he's the Lord. He's the Lord mm -hmm. of heaven and mm -hmm. earth, right? Which implies that he's still engaged. He's sovereign over mm -hmm. it all. Now, we could look at many other. Hebrews chapter 1 has other references. Maybe a Hope Sabbath School member saying, oh, I... Eric, I have another text because it's woven through the scripture, isn't it? That God is the creator and he wants a relationship, relationship. with us. That's crucial to mm -hmm. this whole understanding yeah. of the covenant. Amen. Okay. But let's go back to Genesis, Trisha Lee, where you started our study to Genesis 1, verse 31, because <laughs> some people are having a question. They're saying, well, if God's the creator <laughs> and I'm told God is good, mm -hmm. why are things so bad? Mm. Why are we living in a damaged world? What, what happened? 
How does scripture read in Genesis 1 verse 31? Reading from the New King James Version, then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So what's the big question at the end of Genesis 1 that remains unanswered? What went wrong? What went wrong? wrong? Right. right. Mm. You know, the title, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damaged world, what happened, right? Yeah. Perfect creation, God's the creator. He not only made it, he didn't leave. He wants a relationship with yeah. us. He's like the good shepherd over his sheep. So, well, let's keep reading. We'll answer that question in a little while because it's why we need this everlasting covenant Amen. that we're going to be studying about in mm. this series. Mm -hmm. Let's go back a few verses in Genesis 1, uh, verses 26 and 27. Jason, if you could read oh, yeah. that for us. By the way, people are listening and saying, you're saying Jason a lot. Well, we've got two Jasons <laughs> on the team today, right? Um, Jason Lawson, yeah. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. 27. Amen. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish and the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Now, I'm going to ask a question that you might say, Derek, I don't think you have the right to ask that question, and you may not understand the answer even if God gave it to you, but let me ask it anyway. Why do you think God created human beings in his image? Hmm. What do you think? Does it tie back into a comment, Jason, uh -huh. that you made earlier? I mean, what, why do you think he did that, Christian? Well, you know, God, God is, God is one of fellowship. God wants to be able to have a common experience with, with his creation. And, you know, I, one of the characteristics of God is that he, he's a God who invites us to reason with him. Uh -huh. You know, and I, and I think about his creation. The only beings that can reason are human beings created in his image. Mm. And so God would want a, a relationship with beings that he can reason with. Someone might say, I have a relationship with my puppy. Right. <laughs> and my puppy loves me. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, w w you said that's not the same. Yeah. Talk to us about that. And I have a puppy. Okay. <laughs> I love my puppy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as Christian said, God wants to be able to communicate with us in a way that we understand what he, who he is and he understands us. Mm. And although my puppy loves me, I can't talk to my puppy in a way that she can communicate with me and we can have a bond that is actually growing mm. um, in, in a level of humanism that is just not there. And so I think God really is a relational God and he wants someone he can relate to and can really appreciate who he is and can appreciate us for what we can also give him. What does it mean, uh, Trisha Lee, do you think? And again, we're stepping on kind of sacred territory. <laughs> He says, we're going to make man in our image. And by the way, man there is, is male and female, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the human family in our image. What, what do you think that means? I mean, I think we'll find out when we get to heaven. But I do, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do agree with Nicole and I agree with Christian that there is something special about the human family, about being different and being able to have relationship and reasoning, you know, with one another. And I think that, you know, when you are God, you know, triune and, and omnipotent, with all this love and purpose, mm -hmm. I believe he wanted to share that with, you know, this special part of the creation, human, humanity. He wanted to share that capacity for fellowship, that capacity to share and grow and, and to have these relationships that can be so fulfilling. So let's keep reading, Jason, if you could go to Genesis 2. Because it's interesting, we have two accounts of creation. And some people say, are they written by different people? Are they contradicting each other? I think they're just sharing different dimensions of the creation account. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some details, if you could read for us in Genesis 2, verse 7 and verses 18 through 25, that give us a, a, more of a picture that, that, that you've been painting of this relational God who wants to have a, not just a relationship, but a loving mm -hmm. relationship yeah. with, with uh, the human family. Yeah. Jason? I've got the New King James Version here. 
Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, then 18 through 25. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then verses 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of its rib, his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. You know, one of my favorite preachers, his name was C.D. Brooks, he, he describes this text and he says, I, I don't think Adam, when he first saw Eve, thought, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> 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 there was something very special about this whole creation yeah. process. But I was looking while you were reading, remembering Psalm 33, where it said, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, mm -hmm. and all the hosts by the breath of his mouth. That's verse 6. Verse 9 says, He spoke, mm -hmm. and it stood fast. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't He do that here? Mm -hmm. He's done it in, in, in creating this whole ecosystem we call planet Earth, but now He, he gets very personal. Jason, mm -hmm. why, why do you think that is? Down in the ground. I mean, it sounds very messy. Very messy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I think sometimes, and we see this in experience, you really don't know a person the same way until you get down into what they're doing. And in this case, God is literally going into the ground and literally forming uh, man. He's, he's doing something special with this creation, putting more intricate details. I mean, he does that, you know, with all his creation, but there's something special, something more different about the way he forms man. It reminds me of artists, you know, they could just, you know, mass produce something, but a lot of them, if you see them like sculpting or painting, they put specific details in mind that you can see that's their touch, that shows their identity in the creation. Now, we know we're not made of dirt, Nicole, you know that, right? <laughs> but, but there's this picture of material substance mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. the breath of God, right, right. and man becomes a living soul, mm -hmm. could have done that for Eve too. Uh, why do you think it's different in creating woman? But they're both created in the image of God, right? right. They both reflect the image of God. I would say that it, it shows his character. He wants us to be partners in this process with him. He wants us to have ownership somewhat of what's going on in this world. And so I think that's why he let Adam name the animals. He let the woman come from, from, the, from the rib of Adam. I think it's all his desire for us to be a part of this process with him and not just him you know, doing for us and us not being a part of the process. All right. And certainly we would agree that he didn't need a rib. No. Right. I mean, he's like, people are like, that's weird. Well, but, but it was to teach something, mm -hmm. right? Um, what do you think, Trisha Lee? Um, I think just like, you know, with God, we would never say, you know, that the Father or Son or Holy Spirit are, is less God. You know, when we say God, we're, you know, that's who we're talking about. I think by taking a rib from Adam to create Eve, uh, to create this woman, it was forever linking them together. Like you mm. are humanity. Mm. Both of you Beautiful. together mm. are this. Um, and I, I think that was what God wanted to say. Not just, I was made first, you were made <laughs> second. Right. You know, I'm a part of you, you're a part of me. You know, mm. we are this human family. Beautiful, beautiful. And Adam's not standing there going, I feel diminished. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's saying, I feel 
and enriched, enhanced. Yeah, exactly. I feel good. You know, I mean, God has done something very good. But, but it's an interesting picture, isn't it? Anyone want to respond again to the creation of the human family? If not, you talked about naming and about being really involved. I have a question that came to mind, and it comes out of Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. And the question is, why didn't our awesome creator, who can speak worlds into existence, create our planet fully populated? Uh, why did he just create a, a human family, a couple? Um, you want to take a shot at yeah, that take before a shot we read we the text? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Let me read the text or just... Well, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, read it first and then reflect on it with us. If you okay, go Genesis well, 1, 28 and 29. All right. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And the Word of God says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and the subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verse 29. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seeds, which is on the face of the, all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. So here a... a um, I, I don't want to call it a task... A sacred assignment mm -hmm. yes. is given to the first couple. What is that sacred assignment? Procreation. Mm -hmm. Which is something <laughs> God creates, Created. right? Right. Right. Yes. right? The angels can't create, no, they can't. Right. Right? right? Yeah. But God gives to this human couple. He creates them with to the create. capacity to procreate. To procreate rather than just mm. saying, oh, here are all of your children and your neighbors are mm. down the road and it's all in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he involves them in that process. Now, before we talk about uh, the details of that, it says he blessed them first. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between the blessing mm. and the sacred assignment? Christian? You know, in, in the New King James Version, uh, verse 28 begins with the word then. Mm -hmm. Then God blessed them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whenever I see the word then, you know, I got to look at the verse just before. Right, right, you exactly. know, there's, there's, a, there's a connection there. And then when I go to verse 27, the very last thought there is male and female. He created them. Mm -hmm. Then God blessed them. Right. Okay. And I can't help but to notice this, that God is blessing, specifically now, he's blessing their sexuality. Amen. Amen. He's blessing the fact that they're male and female mm -hmm. and that they are given the ability to procreate. God blesses them. Amen. And I can't help but to realize this. And then, of course, he follows with instructions, you know, be fruitful and multiply. But I can't help but to think this. Isn't it true that the enemy often attacks wow. the very things that God blesses. Blesses. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. He blessed the seventh day. God, Satan attacks it. Right. Here God blesses the human sexuality, mm. and we know the rest of the story. story right. Amen. Wow, that's... Uh, anybody want to respond to that? I, I that's agree. kind of a profound <laughs> thought, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because they can't procreate by themselves. Mm. No. No. Together, they reflect the image of God. Mm. Right, right. And part of the awesome God is that He's creator God, mm. Mm -hmm. right? But, but this procreation, God intends to happen under His blessing. Blessing. Yes. yes. Right. Trisha Lee. So I, I agree with what Christian described, and I also want to highlight, you know, being fruitful and multiplying to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Um, if you look through the animal kingdom, there are probably other species that outnumber humans, uh, maybe bugs or something, but <laughs> they, they, are, they are, you know, more numerous than we are, but they don't have the blessing to dominate unless, you know, God sends a plague and they, <laughs> they terrorize us. But, you know, they don't have that blessing to subdue and to dominate. And I think that God, because of who he is, wanted us to have this elevated position in creation and I think that there's a blessing not just in us being kind of the top of creation, but a blessing in us coming into that position. 
He didn't just hand it to us, but there was some effort, even in a perfect world, that we kind of grow into, mature into, multiply into this um, elevated position of being responsible for the earth, responsible for the other animals, and of course, as Christian mentioned, enjoying this process and the blessing that God gave us to fulfill this purpose. Mm -hmm. I think the two go hand in hand, the blessing. Amen. Amen. So, what lessons have you learned? We've got a couple of parents here, I think, right? Nicole, you have children. Christian, you mm -hmm. have children. Um, and I know lots of our Hope Sabbath School members around the world are saying, Derek, I have, I have lessons I've learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of you are taking notes of lessons that you'll, mm -hmm. you'll need to learn. But what lessons, we're talking here, God inviting us to join Him in His creative work, right? right. And Nicole, maybe you could start. Uh, what lessons have you learned as a parent that you'd say, God, I'm not sure I would have learned that any other way, mm -hmm. or at least you use this setting to teach me some important lessons, especially about you. Mm. Well, I, I can think of two off the bat. Uh, first, I've learned the, the joy of creation. Um, I don't think that I understood or even appreciated what it meant to actually have a being that was like you, from you, that you now are responsible for mm -hmm. all of the pieces of their life, at least for their formative years, um, than with me having my own children. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, I've understood the joy of creation having my own, my, someone from me in the world. My second thing I've learned is that I see the love and patience of God, um, especially when it comes to making decisions that are not something that I'd want my child to do. I've had to learn to love them even with their poor decision making because God loves me. Mm -hmm. And it helped me realize how I hurt God's heart when I do things that he's asked me not to do. Mm -hmm. And I think I've learned that more when I see my kids doing it to me and I'm like, oh, this is what I do to God every day. <laughs> and so it's, for me, it's a reminder that I have to really live my life in a way that represents God so my kids can do it also. And so that to me is something that I've learned through my kids that I don't think I would have learned anywhere else. Hmm. Now you understand all about physiology, but it's different when it's bone of your bone and flesh it of is. your flesh. It is, right? yes. Right? Mm -hmm. This is your This little, is mine. <laughs> this is your baby or your babies, right? Yeah, two Not old. just mm -hmm. a baby. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, two. Christian, mm -hmm. uh, you're mm -hmm. coming off as a father. Uh, you have yeah. two children. Yes. Uh, what has God taught you that you say, hmm, I think God has some lessons to teach us through this process. You know, I have an 11-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son. And, um, and one of the greatest lessons I've learned is, is to see their dependence on me mm. for their emotional mm. and their physical well-being. They depend on me for that. You know, and the, the reality is, is that if I neglect, you know, providing for their f emotional and physical well-being, they'll suffer, right. you know, they'll suffer. But because they depend on me, I recognize the, the huge responsibility I have. Mm. But then it dawns on me, wait a minute, God, mm. he's constant, he never fails. Mm -hmm. He's constantly providing that emotional and, and physical well-being, you know, for, for our good. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that that just overwhelms me with with a, a sense and appreciation of of God's character. Right now, we all have children in our circle of influence. Mm -hmm. Two Jasons, Trisha Lee, right? Two. What lessons you look? Maybe it was it's a sibling or a niece or a nephew or what? What lessons has God been teaching you uh, through this whole process of participating in His creative work, Jason? Well, actually, I do a Bible study at uh, my church, uh, Junior Sabbath School. Okay, and so these are youngsters. These are youngsters, yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it, at first, I was kind of skeptical because I'm used to, like, this, you know, age group, be able to bounce ideas off each other and what have you. Of course, the little ones, they need a little bit more motivation, you know. And sometimes it can be like pulling teeth at times to be able to get somebody to pray, you know. But it, sh <laughs> it showed me to be able to break down the Word in little pieces, you know, little breadcrumbs, the bread of life, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to feed to them. So it really gave me an observation of being patient with them because, wow. you know, God is patient with us, you mm -hmm. know. It's beautiful, me beautiful. personally, yeah, truly. Paul talks about, you know, some, the baby you feed milk and, and right. not, not uh, solid food. Food, but, exactly, yeah. But you learned that lesson. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, yes, 
Jason. So I'm a leader of a group of, I guess you could call them pre-teenagers. It's an organization called Pathfinders, which uh -huh. is kind of like Boy Scouts in the United States or other places. And uh, these kids are about 12 years old, 13 years old. And what I really like is, you know, we're having a Bible discussion and I'm sharing with them lessons on history. And it's amazing to me because even though I'm so much older than them and have way more knowledge, uh, the insights that they can provide and the understanding they have, it's, it's kind of amazing. It shows, you know, that even though I may be way more older and theoretically say mature, God can still bless young people with amazing insights, yeah. with amazing understanding of his character. And so you don't have to be, you know, our age to be able to understand God's love. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. We're going to go on now in this, uh, you know, we're so far so, so good. Yeah, mm -hmm. God is putting now a, a test in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, Trisha Lee, if you could read for us 16 and 17. Um, why does he do that? We, we actually need some other books of the Bible, or at least the next chapter, uh, to, to answer that question. But, but let's see what we read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Reading from the New King James Version. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Hmm. Why is there a test of, of allegiance in the middle of the garden? Christian. You know, Adam and Eve have been given the, the freedom of choice, mm -hmm. okay, moral freedom. Mm -hmm. And moral freedom not only includes making good moral choices, but moral freedom must also include the ability to make bad or immoral choices. Mm. And so, and so I, I believe that in the whole scheme of things, there is there's a certain uh, joy yeah. in, in making good choices. You know, it's almost like you get in, a, in a, uh, endorphins, yeah, you know, yeah, sure. because you're making good choices. And, and so there's a joy in being able to actually have the experience of choosing to obey or of choosing to do good. You know, you got to have that joy. In the context of this loving relationship yes. with our Creator. Yes. 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 But, but, you know, when Christian said that, and I'll come to your point, Nicole, part of me recoiled. I mean, I think you told me the truth. <laughs> Part of me recoiled when you said it also gives us the pre freedom to make bad mm -hmm. or immoral choices. Oh, right. And I went, oh, <laughs> oh you yeah. know, uh, why did God do that? I mean, Trish Lee. I mean, I don't want to be funny, but I mean, I think about, you know, a wedding or, you know, my own marriage and, you know, our family and friends were there. But I don't think my family members or relatives would be excited if my husband had dragged me down the aisle mm -hmm. with ropes. <laughs> and, you know, put a stake in the ground, you know, at the <laughs> altar, they would probably be really sad for me, but they were rejoicing because I willingly mm. right. went up there. Look at that smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I said vows and he said vows and we wanted to be in this relationship. Beautiful. So I think that the freedom to choose in both directions is a blessing to choose to be with someone. Yeah. But it's also, I think, for the heart of God, um, he, he cannot lie and he has to be honest with himself. Yeah. Just like we have to be honest, you know, it's not love if I'm forcing someone right. to be with me, um, but it's love if they, ha they can choose anyone and they still choose me. Now, I know your husband Stanton is an awesome man, but, but someone might say, Trisha Lee, you took a risk. Mm. Mm. We both took risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We both took risks, um, but that's love. Yeah. Love comes with risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very profound. <laughs> yep. God also took a risk, yes. Christian, right? Yes. Yeah. With giving us freedom, but but it's only that freedom that mm. that allows us to love Him with our whole heart, yes. Amen. right? Amen. To experience that intimate communion, mm -hmm. Nicole. Well, I, when I when I saw this question, when I was actually doing this study, I thought of it a little bit differently, and I thought that the Lord wanted to preserve the pleasures of the world. He knew that once they tasted that fruit the pleasures of the world would no longer be for them. They were gonna have sin, they were gonna have destruction, they were gonna have death. So I feel that he was trying to preserve what the world was going to be with just him and them by asking them not to partake of this fruit. So that's how I kind of looked at it. I don't have the answer to this question, so you, you know, we'll probably get a thousand emails, but do you think the Creator told them about, about the great battle that went on in, in heaven. Uh, were they alerted to the fact that there was 
a great controversy mm. going on between good and evil. Mm. Christian, oh, what do you think? I, I think so. Yeah. I, I would say yes. The reason I, I'm, I say yes is because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, there's, there's two words in particular that, that are very, very uh, interesting words. One is evil. Mm -hmm. God says, uses the word evil, and then he uses the word die. Mm. Okay? And none of those are in their perfect no, environment, right? right? No. Exactly. Before this very moment, you know, the word evil, I right. mean, that wasn't even, even a concept in their minds, much less die. What right. did die? W what does that mean, mean die? Right. Mm. And I believe that mm. I, can, I can almost hear Adam and Eve saying, e evil? Oh, evil? <laughs> what, what's evil? And mm. die? What, what's die? Mm. And in response to those questions, you gotta, you gotta believe that he would have spoken of the enemy. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm. Could you take us to Revelation? Okay. Uh, I'm so thankful that all scripture is given by inspiration Amen. of God, right? Amen. These are not just human opinions, holy men, of God, holy women of God, moved by the Holy Spirit. Revelation 12 gives, gives us some powerful insights, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Maybe we could at least look at verses seven through nine. Um, but, but that's, I think you're right on, uh, you're accurate when you say the fact that he's talking about evil and death, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's clearly told them about a battle that's yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Revelation chapter 12, verses seven to nine. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Mm -hmm. Now that's our earth. I mean, it speaks about our planet, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna discover as we come into Genesis three, how the enemy, once mm -hmm. called Lucifer, mm -hmm. covering mm -hmm. cherub, yep. then referred to as Satan mm -hmm. or yep. the devil, the devil mm -hmm. or that old serpent, serpent mm -hmm. which is a reference to Genesis three we're coming to, um, that that battle is, is, is raging. Mm. And it's in the context of that that God places this sign of loyalty, mm -hmm. a choice that we have to make, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that choice is motivated by what? Love. Well, love. Satan would use fear, right? right. God uses love. God uses, uses love. love. You know, I'm thinking of a, a New Testament verse, Nicole. Maybe you could go to John 14 mm -hmm. and read for us because I think you're right. This whole this whole process is about a revelation of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. Amen. Even after things get damaged, yeah. right. God's love doesn't change. Doesn't. Could you find John 14? And if you could read for us verse 15 and verse 23. This is Jesus speaking. In the New International Version, John 14, verses 15 and 23. 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. Verse 23 says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Amen. That's good news. God says, you know, Jesus says that we're going to make a home with you. That, that's, that's what Eden was all about, yes. Yes. right? Mm -hmm. yes. But the motivation is love. 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 Yeah, if you love me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to feel that in this, before they know what's going to happen in Genesis 3, mm. trust me and obey me because I love, I love, I love you. you. I love you and mm. you love, love me, me. Yes. right? Yes. So I'm going to ask a question before we get to Genesis 3 where things get really damaged. Um, how can we develop, what's the word I'm looking for? How can we develop that trust where, where we'll do what God asks us to do out of love, even when we don't really understand it all? Mm. What do you think, Nicole? I would say practice. I mean, that's what I have to do in the little things. Okay. Um, it's not just you're going to trust him because we're humans. So we want to question, we want to doubt. And so for me, I have to trust him in the little things because then I'll trust him in the big things. 
So for me, it's practice and actually reaching out and saying, Lord, give me the strength to follow you in the little things so that when you trust me with big things, I can follow you then also. You know, when Nicole said that, the story flashed into my mind. We'll study later in our series, which is the, the story of uh, Abraham. Mm. First, he's told to leave her, and I'll tell you where to go. That was trust. Right. Later, he's got to take his son up onto yes. the mountain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying obedience is motivated by love. I guess it's built in those yes. little decisions. Mm -hmm. we can yeah. Trust is built. Yeah, I was going to say, it also plays a role in knowing the person. You know, sure. to trust and know God. And as I've been reading the Psalms, I've seen that phrase so many times as far as I will trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know David, you know, who wrote a majority of the Psalms. He had the relationship. You know, he was a man after God's own heart. So you can see that knowing the God that we serve will enhance that trust. And then you will want to lovingly obey him as you continue the journey on. We're going to go to Genesis 3, but I saw two hands, and I'm not going to shut them down. So, Trisha Lee and then uh, Jason. I'm, I'm just so touched by uh, both Jason and, and Cole's comments about practice, and it, it just makes me think that, you know, um, we're, we are learning as we're getting to know God, and we're learning that trust is growing. We can learn to trust God more and more mm -hmm. from the little things growing up to big things. And it's not a blind trust that God calls us to. This is not, you know, the stranger on the corner. Trust right. me. No, that's, that's not wise. No. God has shown us enough through our life and enough mm -hmm. in creation, enough for Adam and Eve that you can trust me. I, I think it's back to that choice. We choose to act on what we know about God mm. and trust Him in those individual decisions. But it is a learning process. As we trust Him in something small today, we are learning to trust Him in something bigger tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jason, do you want to add to that? And building off that, it may require risk. It may feel like a risk to us in our human nature and in our fear. But we need to just not let our fear control us and just take that step of faith as we've seen, looking at what God has done in the past to see what he'll do in the future. I'm yeah. seeing that happening in both in marriage relationships yeah. and parent-child relationships, yeah. both ways, Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm asked to trust someone that I don't know, one of the first things I do is I look at their track record. Right. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, when I look yeah. at God's track record, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. You know, it yeah. takes me back to at least two episodes, one to the cross. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm and then going further back to the incarnation. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah. And I look the at the- love of God. Yes, mm -hmm. and I look at the incarnation, okay? Mm -hmm. And can one truly fully understand mm -hmm. how God mm -hmm. became flesh? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we can fully understand. Can we tr fully understand how God, the Word in the flesh, okay, was crucified mm -hmm. and breathed His last? Mm -hmm. You know, can we truly fully understand that? Mm. No, we can't, mm. okay? But yet these things express the fullness of God's love that Amen. I can't even comprehend. Amen. And so then I ask myself, can I fully understand, you know, you know that, um, that I can trust God? Well, the answer is, no, I can't fully understand, yeah, right. but I will. Mm. But I will. Amen. 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 Uh, the text flashed into my mind, Behold what manner of love the Father has given yes. unto us, yes. that we should be called children Amen. of God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, well, we're going to move to chapter 3, because this whole series on the promise, the everlasting covenant, is based on the thing, the fact that we don't still live in a perfect environment. Mm. We live in a damaged world. Mm -hmm. um, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6, records the adversary's attack. Mm. Before we read it, I have a question. We know from a study of Scripture that the adversary is a fallen angel, once called Lucifer, a covering cherub, mm -hmm. yes. right? Mm -hmm. Cast out of heaven to the earth, mm -hmm. and his angels cast out with him, Revelation says. So there's a cosmic battle going on. Why do you think this fallen angel doesn't just show up hmm. to Adam and Eve and say, my name was once called hmm. Lucifer, they have other names for me now, but I'm involved in a rebellion against the Creator God, uh, and I want to invite you to join me in the rebellion. Hmm. Why do you think he uses what deception? Hmm. Nicole? Because that's what he knows. That's hmm. who he is. 
And so he's going to come to us in the way that he knows best. He knows deception best. He was able to deceive a third of the angels. And so he comes that way. I mean, no one would follow someone that said, I want to kill you, so I'm come with me. Mm -hmm. mm. They're going to come with you and you say, oh, I have candy. You know, come with me. It's nice. They're going to tempt you into coming to them and then they're going to do what they need to do to you. So mm. he's not a fool to, to present himself to you as the devil. He's going to present himself to you as this is an option. Yeah. It's, it's not so bad. It's an option. Right. Take this option and see how it goes. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus in John 8, I think verse 44, called him a liar oh, yeah. and the father oh, yeah. of lies. Yeah, that's all he knows. Father of lies. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise us that he doesn't come as an angel, <laughs> but he comes as a serpent. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at the mm. text. Jason, can oh, yeah, you read pleasure. from us yeah. in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6? All right, and I'll be reading from the King, New King James Version, Genesis, the third chapter, 1 through 6 verse. And the Bible says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows in that day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when... The woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Hmm. Now this serpent, called in Revelation the old serpent, is not only lying, mm. what's he doing? He's blaming God. He's calling God a, a liar. liar. Yeah. yeah. Mm. He's saying God said that, but he's lying. Right. Mm -hmm. That's his weapon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deception. Yeah. Yeah. Lies. Lies. <laughs> and he'll even call God a liar. Yeah. Now, Eve is deceived, but then she gives to Adam and he eats. Mm -hmm. Is his transgression more serious than hers? What do you think? Well... <laughs> Later on in the Bible, and I'm not sure what scripture we know, and you, you'd know, Pastor, um, we're told that from one man's sin, mm -hmm. sin entered the world. So we realize it was a combination of not just Eve <laughs> taking that fruit, but kind of Adam sealing it mm -hmm. in his decision. Because at that point, it's the whole human race that sinned. We mm -hmm. don't know what would have happened, you know, if it was just Eve alone. But clearly, with the two of them doing the same thing, we're doomed at this point. Um, but I would ag agree in kind of where your question was going that at the point that Eve approaches Adam, he hasn't spoken to the serpent. So no one's planted lies and deception in his mind. His decision is, do I join my wife in disobedience or do I go to God? So he's not being deceived. He's making a choice. Mm, right. You know, someone once said the base of every sin is the same. Will I trust fully in God mm -hmm. or take things into my own hands? Right. Yep. Mm. I got a talking snake here, but God says, don't. Will I trust him or will I take the fruit? Right. Mm -hmm. My wife that I love with all my heart is telling me I ate the fruit here. Will I trust fully in God or take yeah. things mm. into my own hands? Mm. The temptation, I mean, the test is the same. Right. Yes. Though yeah. the temptation may vary. Yes. And certainly Romans 7 talks about that whole issue of sin entering the world. We know if we read on that uh, all of a sudden they feel naked, mm -hmm. they're trying to cover themselves. But what I want to focus on in the last minutes is how God responds because this whole series is about a God who loves us with an immeasurable and unfailing love, who, who wants to make a covenant with us mm -hmm. that we don't deserve because we know the wages of sin is death, so we don't deserve it. Let's see how God responds. Christian, could you read verse 9 of Genesis 3 and then verse 15? Okay. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 and 15. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. 
he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Hmm. Speaking there to the serpent, yes. yeah. but back to verse 9, what's God doing Sir. when, when we've, we've made a foolish decision, we've, da we've damaged, we've, we've defaced the image of God, what's God doing? He's searching for us. He's searching for us, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, Christian. And, and of course, when it, God is asking, where are you? Obviously, it's not because he doesn't know, but rather it's because they really don't know what they've done. Mm -hmm. right. And God is wanting them to recognize that, what have I done to myself? What and have I done? first covenant promise is given in Genesis 3.15 mm -hmm. about a seed. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to ask Jason if you go to Galatians chapter 4 for us, because the Apostle Paul says that seed was not just any seed. Mm -hmm. That seed of the woman who would crush mm -hmm. the serpent was none other than Jesus. Mm -hmm. Galatians 4, verses uh, 4 through 7. All right. I have the New King James Version here. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of the time had come, God set forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Mm. Come Amen. back into the family. Amen. 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 And, and I read, you know, born of a woman, that's the only way to be born. Mm. But the prophecy was that it was the seed of the woman, woman. Yes. that would, would, was the promise, mm -hmm. yes. the deliverance comes through Jesus. We're going to be studying about that covenant promise revealed in many ways throughout the scripture. And I'm just glad that you're going to be with us on the journey. We're in a damaged world. We can see it. But God reaches out to us with His immeasurable and unfailing love, His promise, His everlasting covenant. I pray that as we go on this journey that your heart would be encouraged mm -hmm. to come home to a God who loves you with an immeasurable and unfailing love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we begin this journey, we thank you that you're a God of promises, a God of immeasurable and unfailing love. In the midst of this damaged world, you give us hope in you. May we receive that hope, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. Just getting started on this series, we're going to discover the love of God like never before. Accept his saving love. And then go out and be a blessing to those around you.